So in this first section regarding peptic ulcer disease, we'll be studying about different things such as the epidemiology, the causating factors, the etiology, and different types of ulcers. We'll be studying about refractory ulcers and stress ulcers. So as peptic ulcer is being divided into two types of ulcers, one being the gastric ulcers and the other being the duodenal ulcers. Gastric means that the ulcers are present within the stomach and duodenal ulcers that it is present within the duodenum. So if we talk about the epidemiology, there's been remarkable changes in the epidemiology of peptic ulcers in the past two centuries. So if we talk specifically about the gastric ulcers, there was a peak in the incidence of gastric ulcers in the first half of the 19th century. And then if we talk about the second half of the 19th century, duodenal ulcers arised and they had the most uh, peaked incidence. So if we talk about Helicobacter pylori infection, it is usually acquired during the childhood and it manifests as peptic diseases in the later ages when the child has grown up and uh, probably in the, uh, in the adult life. So if we talk about the incidence of duodenal ulcer and the gastric ulcer, it usually declines with the decline of the Helicobacter pylori infection. So this is usually because of improved sanitary conditions and improved water uh, and uh, food supply. So based on the physician's diagnosis, the annual incidence of peptic ulcer disease is around 0.14% to 0.19% specifically in the developed countries. And if you talk about the geographic variation, there's a very, very wide geographic variations in the prevalence of peptic ulcer disease and the annual inc incidence of bleeding which is a complication of peptic ulcer disease among the population was around 19 to 57 per uh, thousand individuals so bleeding is the foremost uh, uh, most highest uh, contributing complication regarding peptic ulcer disease and if we talk about a different complication there is perforation uh, which also occurs as a complication of the peptic ulcer disease and the incidence of uh, perforation is around 4 to 14 in a thousand uh, in a hundred thousand individuals so if we talk about etiology the causes of peptic ulcer disease the prime and the highest risk factors regarding peptic ulcer disease is of Helicobacter pylori infection and second being the use of aspirin and NSAIDs and thirdly the most uh, highest uh, number of peptic ulcer disease which is nowadays which slightly is growing is the idiopathic ulcers which is also known as the HP negative and the NSAIDs negative type of ulcers which does not really have a cause. So if we see in this pie chart, uh, there's a comparison between the duodenal ulcers and the gastric ulcers. So in both of the of these peptic ulcer uh, peptic ulcers, Helicobacter pylori infection has the is the major cause of these ulcers, and second being the NSAID use and uh, the aspirin use. But if we compare duodenal and gastric ulcers, gastric ulcers uh, is is more prone because of the use of uh, NSAIDs and aspirin. Other than that, there are other factors regarding uh, the, uh, the causing factors of uh, peptic ulcer diseases, zollinger ellison syndrome and other unknown factors that causes peptic ulcer disease. So if we talk more specifically about the Helicobacter pylori infection regarding peptic ulcer disease, the Helicobacter pylori infection nowadays is declining. So the fact that Helicobacter pylori infection is declining, the peptic ulcer disease is also declining. But still, Helicobacter pylori infection remains the most major cause of peptic ulcer disease worldwide. If we talk about uh, the prevalence without, within different countries, um, USA and the European countries have the lowest prevalence of uh, peptic ulcer disease due to the fact that helicobacter pylori infection in these countries are very low. So if we talk more specifically about uh, this infection, it causes an antrum type more predominant 
type of uh, gastritis antrum is that it involves the uh, the part of the stomach which is more which is the end part of the stomach which which is called as antrum the um, incidence of uh, antrum type of gastritis is around 10 to 20 percent in, in in a population so this uh, antrum type of gastritis it causes high gastric acid secretion which ultimately causes an increased risk of duodenal ulcers so what really happens is that this high type of gastric acid which is produced within the stomach as in this picture uh, gastric acid is produced within the stomach and it uh, it is being uh, transferred into the duodenum so this acid load which is an increased acid load which occurs and which enters the duodenal the duodenal part of the small intestine it causes injury to the mucosa of the duodenum and it causes duodenal ulcers other than that there is a pan gastritis which involves the antrum part of the stomach and the fundal part of the stomach it causes lower gastric acid secretion which predisposes to more gastric ulcers so the part of the stomach it is normal to have a high amount of acid which usually prevents any type of gastric ulcer to uh, to occur but in pan gastritis what actually occur what actually happens is that there's a decrease in the gastric acid and it causes it makes the stomach and the mucosa of the stomach more prone to uh, develop uh, a, a gastric type of ulcer so the second type of uh, cause causating factor of peptic ulcer disease is the use of aspirin and NSAIDs as aspirin, aspirin is being widely used within the population of the world and around 11 percent of the population of the u.s uh, uses aspirin on a daily basis so the regular use of NSAIDs causes an increased odds of gastrointestinal bleeding which is up to five to six folds so the use when whenever there is a person who uses aspirin or NSAIDs more regularly the patient is more prone to um, develop upper intestinal bleeding which is after uh, developing a gastric ulcer so this usually damages the mucosa by the suppression of pg uh, prostaglandin synthesis so what exactly happens is that as aspirin and NSAIDs there they are cox cox um, inhibitors so this cox uh, inhibitors inhibits cox so what does cox really do it uh, it helps in the synthesis of prostaglandins which ultimately helps in um, the defense uh, mechanism of the stomach or the duodenal uh, mucosa so this and said when taken as it is a cox inhibitor it suppresses the the formation or the uh, or the development of uh, prostaglandins which ultimately then causes a weak weakness in the uh, in the mucosa in the defense mucosa so there's a third type of uh, ulcers which is called as idiopathic ulcers so this type of ulcers is slightly increasing it is a helicobacter pylori negative ulcers and NSAIDs negative ulcers it means that in these type of ulcers it is not because of the um, because of the infection or because of the ingestion of these type of medicines so these type of ulcers they're slightly increasing patients with idiopathic ulcers is around 20 to 30 percent in the US so the high incidence of recurrent ulcer bleeding this type of ulcer is more prone you know, to uh, to develop uh, gastrointestinal bleeding within the stomach so if we talk about uh, different types of uh, causating factors of idiopathic ulcers cocaine the ingestion of cocaine and the use of cocaine causes multiple ulcers within the stomach and the duodenum the use of bisphosphonates for example in patients such as osteoporosis these bisphosphonates are also um, they also develop a different type of gastric ulcers within the stomach 
the use of glucocorticoids which are steroids the use of steroids and NSAIDs uh, as a combined effect causes more ty more different types of uh, peptic ulcers within the stomach and the duodenum as compared to NSAIDs being ingested alone the use of selective serotonin uh, receptors and the use of uh, alcohol and there are also uh, some factors such as stress that can also cause um, these idiopathic ulcers and lastly smoking being uh, one of the foremost reasons of uh, different types of ulcers within the stomach and the duodenum so there's a um, different type of ulcer called as the refractory ulcer so what exactly is a refractory ulcer what happens is that um, the patient uh, has is, is uh, has a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer so what happens is that after the um, treatment of uh, these ulcers such as the anti-secretory uh, therapy these patients still persist and uh, despite having this treatment the patients still have these ulcers so these ulcers are known as refractory ulcers is that these ulcers they are not being treated with the help of anti-secretory therapy or any other therapies or treatment of the peptic ulcer disease so um, the symptoms of this refractory type of ulcer persist and may be very severe. The ulcers become asymptomatic and is usually only uh, detected with the, with the help of endoscopy. So a clinician, uh, when a patient presents with a refractory ulcer, the clinician might uh, ask different types of questions, <clears throat> such as, uh, has the patient compiled with the prescribed treatment? The second question might be, um, is the ulcer penetrating the pancreas, liver or other organs? So that is why the refractory ulcer is not healing. The third question might be about that, is there, is there a presence of helicobacter pylori infection? Is the patient still taking an NSAID, in fact, uh, being, um, being advised not to take any type of aspirin or NSAIDs? because these are, the all, these are also the causating factors of ulcers. And lastly, asking the patient whether the patient smokes cigarettes or not. So these type of ulcers are uh, present despite the, um, the therapy, the anti-secretory therapy given to these patients. So these, the clinicians finally, they um, come to a point where they decide that this is, an, this is a refractory type of ulcer. And the treatment of this refractory type of ulcer is that the patient is being given the anti-secretory therapy, which is given for a more prolonged time period so that the patient, um, so that these refractory ulcers can heal. Finally, the second type of ulcer is known as the stress ulcers. These stress ulcers are usually present in very critically ill patients who are usually um, present in the uh, ICU. Minority of these patients usually present with gastrointestinal bleeding as a complication. There's always a respiratory, respiratory failure or a coagulopathy uh, type of strong risk factors related to stress-related uh, ulcers. The endoscopic control of hemorrhage uh, with proton pump inhibitor is the preferred treatment regarding uh, stress ulcers. So the hemorrhage and the bleeding within the esophagus or within the stomach is being treated with the help of an endoscope. And after the patients are given uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, as, um, as an oral intake. And lastly, the patients might also be given IV um, histamine receptors antagonist and sucral fate as a prophylaxis to prevent um, these stress ulcers to occur in patients uh, who are critically ill. So that's all from this first section regarding peptic ulcer disease. Uh, keep watching scardia.com.